Hello. Hello. We're back with another episode of The Horror Guys, number 74. And look at that table jiggle. Don't jiggle the table. Bad, bad. <laughs> so anyway, I'm Kevin. I'm Brian. And we're here to talk about some horror movies. Some good horror movies. Some good. Mostly good. Yeah, I, think, I, I think this I week kinda was liked most, all of these. This week was most, mostly good. Yeah. It's not a rule. Sometimes we have some mm-hmm. real stinkers. Yeah, and, and questionable yeah. and things on the fence. But yeah, overall, this yeah. was an entertaining week. Yeah. Well, this week we'll have the universal film, The Man They Could Not Hang. Which is not true, because they did hang him. Yeah, but he didn't stay hung. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Hammers, The Devil Rides Out. Yeehaw! One little Satan worship it's a western. here. It's a western, Christopher right? Lee. <laughs> Sounds like a western. Yeah. Or a gang, a motorcycle gang. Devil Rides <laughs> Out. It was high noon. That drew. <laughs> and the devil was the better artist. Hmm. That's not what they meant by draw? No, I don't think so. The Italian <laughs> Jello film, Tanabra. And the Netflix film, Platform, which is new in the past week or two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Were they worthwhile? Well, we should talk about that in more depth. Spoilers ahead. Some spoilers. But here we go. So. So. The men they could not hang. But they did. 1939, Boris Karloff. Yeah. Classic. Classic. Not one of the big ones from Boris, but... But it was pretty darn good. I thought it was, I yeah. thought it deserves more fame than it Better has. than some of those later Frankensteins. I had never even heard of this one before. He's got a whole series no. of these. The Man They Could Not Hang, The Man They Killed Twice, The Man With Nine Lives, and I think it's kind of the same. He, he does... So, somehow or another, he winds up on death row, executed, and <laughs> he doesn't stay back. that way. Yeah. That man has been executed more than anybody I know. A hard man to kill. Yeah. Usually, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, directed by Nick Grind, written by Carl Brown and George Wallace Sayre, stars Boris Karloff, Lorna Gray, Robert Wilcox, and like all these oldies, it's only an hour and four minutes. A lot happens. They cram it in. They do. Did you yeah. like it? Yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Don't want to get this one mixed up with that other one we watched, Before I Hang, which came a year after this. Same kind We watched of them both thing. like right back to back. and Back from the dead. really, really similar. <laughs> you only got Karloff kind of being the same guy in them. Yeah, it's like, I like this story. Let's do it again with different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they were both pretty good. Yeah, they were. For being the same thing one year apart, they looked the yeah. same. It's Karloff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They were good. Yeah, overall, yeah. Dr. Lang arrives at Dr. Henrik Savard's huge home and laboratory and hopes that he isn't too late. Yeah, it's quite a home. Too. And he walks in the door and says, I hope I'm not too late. <laughs> and he's carrying the artificial heart that they're hoping to do an experiment with. <laughs> like they were waiting on like him. they're going to start without him? He's got the part that they need. <laughs> so Savard, who is Karloff, is examining a young man on the table who is in perfect shape. He's very healthy. The, uh, Dr. Lang has brought Savard a new artificial heart that they've been working on together. And he warns the young man, whose name is Bob, they're very creative in the mm. 40s, that there may be difficulties with a new heart, but he wants to try it anyway. Bob's all in on science. See, and I misunderstood at first. I thought they were going to like take this guy's heart out, put this artificial heart in. But you know, it's it's like a heart lung machine. Yeah. Before there was a heart lung machine, and I mean, we're an go- external. Yeah, we're going to replace him. your heart. They, they stop all his processes, and then it's like keep him alive. Basketball. Yeah, keep him alive with this artificial, which they do now with heart lung machines during surgeries and open, yeah. you know, open heart surgery. Well, they, they do straight up heart transplants now. This yeah. was all science fiction back then. It was, yeah, yeah. But back then, so anyway, they've got the artificial heart. Yeah, so they're going to kill Bob on purpose. They're going to stop his heart, Mm -hmm. switch the heart, and then wake him up again. Mm -hmm. They figure it'll all take about two hours, and then they can say they can all go out for chop suey afterwards. (laughs) Two hours for a heart transplant. Well, so Betty, Savard's nurse and Bob's girlfriend, begs him not to go through with it. And then runs off. And she's a bit of a twit, isn't she? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because she works there. She knows what's going on. Duh. (laughs) It's like like you read nurses on Facebook who are all anti-vax. And these people are so dumb in this. Really? Yeah. Well, they start the procedure and Bob's heart rate drops to zero. He's dead. Clinically dead. As planned. Clinically dead. Well, I'm well, sure if you get your heart hanging out on the side, you know, well, turned off. It's not hanging out on the side. They just, you know. 
but he's they, dead. But they do this now. You know, I mean, back then, you know, that was that was the interesting part. It's like, well, they, you know, they can do this now. They I'm can, sure they talked theoretically it could be done at the time. But probably. Yeah, they weren't yeah, doing it they, yet. They no. weren't doing it, yeah. So they turn on the cryogenic unit and say it'll take about 30 minutes for the body to chill. They hook up the glass heart to watch the blood flow, and it does its little bloop, bloop, yeah, bloop, it's, got bloop. A shoo, 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 it's kind shoo. of a neat design. Yeah, it is. I, want, I don't know if it was based on any kind of science at the time or not, but... Well, I think it looked believable for mm-hmm. what it was. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Meanwhile, they hook up the glass heart and watch the blood flow. It works great. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, then Nurse Betty goes to the police and screams that Savard's about to kill her boyfriend. Well, the police rush to the house and break in. Too late. He's dead. Well, yeah. Yeah. Savard hears the police outside and gives his partner, Dr. Lang, the heart to hide. Here, take this. They'll take it away. The police then arrest Savard as he screams that he can bring Bob back to life if they just give him another hour. No one listens. Nope, they never do. And Savard yeah. then ends up on trial for murder when Bob times out. He stays dead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody's there to fix it. Stays him. dead for real. Yeah. Well, Savard blames his treacherous nurse, Betty. As and he so should. do we. As he should. Yeah. yeah. She's, Savard. She's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> she is. Yeah. Savard explains the benefits of a heart transplant, which was complete science fiction in 1939. So after much deliberation, the jury doesn't believe him. He's condemned to execution. Well, Savard gets to address the jury before sentencing, and he gives them all, and he lets them have it. He swears they'll all regret their decision. Hmm. And Savard's Janet... Savard's daughter, Janet, goes into hiding at the recommendation of her reporter friend. They make arrangements for Dr. Lang, the partner, to take possession of Savard's body for scientific research. Research. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, then they hang Savard <clears throat> with no arguments. He just goes up and eh, they got him. Later, Lang takes the body into the lab and hooks it up to the heart machine. The machine explodes from being turned up too high. But it works, bringing Savard back to life. Lang repairs the broken neck, which was easy to do when Savard was dead. So Lang can bring people back from the dead with this machine, mm-hmm. but he couldn't. As long as they're fresh. But he couldn't fix Bob. Well, they wouldn't let him. He was hiding in the basement. They didn't arrest him. Oh, they probably took Bob away with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they yeah. were. Yeah, no access. Yeah. Months pass. Scoop Foley, the reporter. You know, some reporters are always named Scoop. Scoop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, Scoop! And 13 people turn their head. Yo! <laughs> well, Scoop Foley catches on to the fact that six men have all hung themselves, and they were all on the Savard jury. What a coincidence. He thinks that looks suspicious. Huh. He returns to Savard's house, as do several other people associated with the trial. They've all received wires or telegraphs or summons or letters, and they're all fakes. But it all gets them together in the house at the same time. Yeah. Well, Savard comes in and surprises them all. He greets each of them one at a time personally, and he claims that the fiend who has killed the six jurors wants to kill all of them as well. Maybe it's not what we think. Hmm. The judge is then electrocuted as he tries to leave. All the doors and windows are barred, and Savard then announces over a loudspeaker that they will now all die one by one. And I thought this was very clever how he did this. They do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No matter how hard they try, he he kind of plays them, and, you know, without going into details, because that's, that's... In 15 minutes, Bob, Joe will die. Yeah. In and 21 so they, minutes, uh, Betty will and, die. And, you know, so they all, you know, gather in a circle. Okay, hold hands and gather in a circle around this person and protect them. And, but, no. Nope, Somehow it still he, happens. He manages. Yeah, it's very clever how yeah. he does that. He's got them. He knows them all, and he knows how he has the house rigged up, and... Series of traps and booby traps and tricks and yeah, he's been thinking cool. about this for a while. Yeah, I liked that. Well, then Janet comes home unexpectedly, and his Savard daughter. explains that he killed Lang, his and his invention will go to the grave with him. Gives him a guilt trip. Yeah, his partner had done nothing but help him, and he killed the partner too, which yeah. makes no sense. Yeah, other than they had to kill the partner too and needed someone to do it. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because he's insane. Crazy man. So he tells Janet to either leave or stay out of the way. Janet, of course, calls his bluff, touches the metal grill, and is also electrocuted. And then one of the the guests shoots Savard. But it's only a flesh wound. Yeah. 
Savard is still not dead, and he hooks Janet up to the machine, I guess he's rebuilt it since it exploded, Mm -hmm. and saves her life. Janet comes back to life in front of the others. Savard has proven he was right. Then Savard gets his gun and destroys the machine, and then dies from his bullet wound. Basically saying, F you all, you can't have the machine. Yes. Yeah. I have beaten death, but not for you. He didn't use the F word because it was a movie from 1939. He didn't have the F word. They, like they hadn't invented the F word yet. <laughs> but, it, but the intent is there. You know? F you all. You ain't getting the machine. Somebody's going to post a comment on YouTube that the F word was invented in 1583 I know, or something. But they didn't use it in black and white movies from 1939 where they wanted a decent rating. <laughs> I guess in one of our earlier episodes we mentioned that The Wolfman came out in 1943. Yeah. Someone commented, no, it was 1941. Okay. I know that. Okay. We misspoke. Okay. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm. All right. So Karloff never got to do much real acting in most of his films. Either he was covered in some kind of mask or makeup, or he had some very simple scripts. In this one, he got to make several really good dramatic speeches and show us that he actually can act. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's kind of surprising. Yeah, it it's, you know, way down on the list of horror films. It's not one of... Not one of the big universals. This is one I'd really recommend checking out, though. It's more mad scientist than monster. Yeah. Yeah, It's also interesting to see Mm -hmm. the perspective and outlook people had on heart transplants before they were actually a thing. This wasn't a historical drama like, say, Frankenstein that took place in the 1700s. This was a contemporary story with a science fiction, bit of science fiction thrown in. Mm -hmm. This took place in 1939. So the whole... You know, the devil's going to get you. There were some things that men were not meant to know that go on in the Frankenstein films. They were a little more advanced than that in the 40s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, it was. Yeah, very much. Speaking of things, there were some, some things that men were not meant to know. The devil rides out. Yeah. Big old horseback. Got his whip and his spurs and... Yeehaw. And this is the the <laughs> third movie that I've seen Charles Charles Gray in. I'm, for as many movies as he's done, I haven't seen... How many acting credits does he have? He must have a ton, but... Well, let's see. He was in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, obviously. Yeah, he uh-huh. was in uh, the legacy. The, one of the, the James legacy. Bond movies. Oh, Actually, he was in okay. two of the James Bond Oh, yeah, Bond that's movies. right. I forgot he was the James Bond movie. Okay, yeah, I forgot about the legacy. Okay. You're right there. Okay. But he's, he's got 136 acting credits. And I bet they're all creepy bad and of, guys. And of those I've seen, like, you know, four, five. Oh, yeah. 1968, four. Hammer film, Devil Rides Out. Christopher Lee says this is his favorite of all the Hammer films. So, directed by Terrence Fisher, written by Richard Matheson and Dennis Wheatley, stars Christopher Lee, Charles Gray, and Nike Arigi. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but eh, they're dead now. They don't matter. One hour, 35 minutes. Link in the show notes. <laughs> Really? Yeah, they can write me a letter. <laughs> okay. And there go the YouTube comments again. Yeah, probably. You know, you spell that some other way. Probably. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Did you like it? I did. Yeah. Best movie ever? No. Is it the best of the Hammers in your opinion? It's up there. It of course, was, Christopher Lee really good. Yeah. Liked it because he had a pretty good role here. Yeah, he gets to like talk and have normal dialogue instead of just hissing, <laughs> hissing and growling. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good guy in this. Yeah. For a change. He's the Duke. Mm-hmm. Spelled D-U-C, according to everything I've read. The and Duke. I don't know. I'm not British, and I don't know all these <laughs> titles. But he's the Duke, spelled D-U-C. Mm-hmm. The Duke picks up Rex at the airport, and they're both worried about their friend Simon, who hasn't taken visitors in ages. They head over to his estate, where there's a party going on that they weren't invited to. Simon explains that it's not a party. It's an astronomical society that I've joined. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Sure it is. Yeah. It's obviously not. Yeah. It's very weird and very international. Very, yeah. Very diverse. There's clearly your your token India guy there. There's your token African guy wearing the African getup. There are various... Token diversity, German, nationalities, German, yeah. And, yeah, just different. to show us how international the situation is. Mm-hmm. So they meet some people. They meet Tanith and Mister Makata. Tanith says that surely there shouldn't be more than thirteen people here, and the Duke knows what's going on immediately. And that's my primary problem with this movie. Mm-hmm. The Duke knows too much. 
He knows a lot. He knows a lot. He's a smart guy. He knows way too much to make the movie <laughs> interesting. He's he's Mr. Exposition. Kind of. Yeah. 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 But Simon suddenly gets uncomfortable. <clears throat> You've got to wonder, now, how does he know all this? It's like he's ran into all of it before. He reads a lot. This is the <laughs> I don't du- know. Duke versus the Devil, part two. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Simon suddenly gets uncomfortable and rushes the Duke and Rex out. He says it's a private party. The Duke wants to see the Astronomical Observatory, and it'll only take five minutes. Well, they go up, and there is a telescope, but there's also a great big goat head painted on the floor, which was pretty cool looking, actually. It looks like it was built there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Well, Rex finds this all very amusing, but the Duke is getting upset. They find a bunch of chickens in the basket, and the Duke screams that he'd rather see Simon dead than involved in black magic. They knock Simon out and carry him out the front door. (laughs) And none of the 13 guests notice. (laughs) The Duke Mm -hmm. then hypnotizes Simon. You will wake up at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. And he places a big cross around Simon's neck. And still under hypnosis tells him, Never take it off. And they carry him in and put him to bed. Five minutes later, the butler goes in and sees Simon trying to choke himself to death with a cross's chain. So the butler takes it off. And of course, without the chain, Simon then runs off through the fields. Uh, The Duke and Rex head back to Simon's house, but he's not there. Suddenly, the goat painted on the floor lights up and smoke comes out of it. And they get a vision of something strange. The Duke screams, Don't look at the eyes! Don't look at the eyes! But Rex looks at the eyes. He looks at the eyes. It's okay, though, because the Duke throws a cross at the thing. It's all right now. Yeah. It just, poof, it's problem, gone. Problem solved. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Duke's good. He made such a big deal out of don't way. look at the eyes, but well, just he didn't the, do anything. Just throw the cross. Well, it kind of hypnotized him. For briefly. Yeah. They decide to track down Tanith, since Rex remembers meeting her at one point in the past. Rex picks her up and tries to keep her from going to the satanic baptism, which is tonight. She dumps him, and soon they're in an antique car chase. The devil interferes, and Rex crashes his own car. Actually, crashes his brother's car. Poor old cars. Yeah, that was um, that'd be awkward to <laughs> explain. Yeah, I mean he, ru- he you know runs up you know out of nowhere you know and <laughs> I need to borrow your car. <laughs> I need to borrow your car. He like stays for five minutes, or less than five minutes. Oh, not even like two minutes. minutes. <laughs> need to borrow your car. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Drives <laughs> off and crashes it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And these are like Rolls Royces and stuff too. These Expensive, are, you, you know, the yeah, rich, early nineteen hundreds cars. cars. Yeah. <laughs> Rich people cars. Yeah. Rex still manages to follow her. Everybody in this is really rich. Mm-hmm. There's no poor working people in this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. They're very upscale. Uh, yeah. yeah. Next time you're looking for a Satanist, check out the rich. <laughs> Rex still manages to follow her on foot and manages to track them to a ritual in the woods. There are a lot more than 13 people at this meeting in the woods. Mokata is in charge, and this is the baptism for Tanith and Simon. They sacrifice a goat... And Rex runs away and calls the Duke from a payphone. The Duke drives all the way out to the country, picks up Rex, and drives there just as the celebration is really getting started. Baphomet shows up, and they begin the baptism. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Well, the Duke and Rex shine a, shine a car's headlights on the proceedings to disrupt things. They grab Simon and Tanith and drive away. <laughs> no, I, I found that scene darkly amusing too because they they break up the you know the ceremony and <clears throat> there's the followers wearing robes and it's just like pandemonium. But they're, all, they're not they're, they're they're all just ah like literally all just running in all different directions. It's two guys <laughs> in a convertible slow down in the crowd, grab two people out of the audience, put them in the car. And, no, and none away. of these people think to reach in and grab them or open the door and fight no, them. No, they all just run around They're and like, scream and wave their hands and pull their hair and fall down. And, and they outnumber <laughs> 10 to 1 easy. Yeah. So, good thing. <laughs> good thing they were that. Uh, yeah. Well, they all had to... They were in, they were, um, in a frenzy or something. Yes, yes, yeah, they were frenzied. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, they all head over to Rex's brother's house again to regroup, and Rex and Tanith have a moment between them. Hmm. Mokata comes to visit the family and hypnotizes the woman, 
the sister-in-law, who she answers was, the door. He was really good in that role, I thought. I yeah. I really liked him in that role. Evil. Evil. Yeah, because he plays a good guy so rarely. Well. Yeah. <laughs> well this fails, but Mokata swears that I won't be back for them, but something, something will. will. Hmm. Yeah. That night, Tanith hypnotizes Rex while under Mokata's influence and escapes. The Duke returns, and he's ready to do battle. They get ready for a ritual of their own. They stand in a circle to defend themselves from the coming attack. There are many temptations to leave the circle, but the Duke is too smart for that. Then, the devil rides in. Did Morn- you like the title? Yeah, on a horse mm-hmm. and everything. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Morning comes, and Tanith is found dead. The angel of death won't leave empty-handed. Simon then uses the opportunity to, to escape. The Duke summons the spirit of Tanith, and she says she'll help Rex. She should tell them where to find Mokata and Simon. Simon then rejoins Mokata, and now they plan to sacrifice Rex's young niece. Now, two or three times, Simon has gone to this guy, and they've rescued him back, and he's like, I'm so glad you rescued me back from that guy. He's bad. But he keeps going back. And he keeps going back Mm -hmm. and participating in this ritual. And you know who survives at the end? Hypocritical Simon. <laughs> yep. I, they rescue him and he gets off scot free after he's caused all this trouble, basically. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, Simon rejoins Makata. Now they plan to sacrifice Rex's young niece, little 10 or 12 year old girl. Mm-hmm. The Duke, Rex, and the girl's parents <clears throat> come to the house and interrupt things. Makata plans to trade the soul of Tanith for the child. Tanith returns in the girl's mother's body and has her say a few magic words. Well, all hell breaks loose, and the entire place bursts into flames, instantly killing all the Satanists and returning Tanith back to life. Must be a hammer film. Time itself has been (laughs) reversed. The Angel of Death took Mokata instead. Well, this thing has so many plot holes, it's Mm -hmm. hard to really point them all out. Yeah, it does. It did. First of all, Simon and Tanith both wanted to be satanically baptized. No, they signed up no, for this. No, they didn't. The Duke rescued them for their own good. They, that's not what they really wanted. They <laughs> were loving every minute of it until the Duke got involved. Yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah. And the whole other crowd was already done, too. These, This is mm-hmm. the two newest members who were oh, nothing yeah. special. Yeah. yeah. They don't put up any fight or objection once they get rescued from the ceremony. They wanted to be there, but they wanted to be rescued, too. Mm-hmm. And then they wanted to go back. And then they wanted to get rescued again. And then, yeah, it's weird. Mm -hmm. You could argue that actually seeing the devil out of that ceremony brought them to their senses. There were an awful lot of people in that ceremony, and clearly they'd all seen him before. Mm -hmm. They weren't too weirded out by this. Oh, it's the devil. must be Tuesday. (laughs) Tuesday is devil day. Not tacos anymore. It also doesn't really explain why Simon and Tanith signed up for all this, or why Mokata wanted them to join so badly. He went to a lot of trouble for these two new recruits. And he had a pretty big crowd. And keeps going through a lot of trouble to try to get them back. Get them back, Get them back, yeah. get them back. And like, well, just let them go. It's a, well, logically, know. you should be able to advertise and get more people than that. No, he was obsessed. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not like either of them were like the chosen one or had any special powers or anything. They no. were just two people. Just a couple rich folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Money didn't seem to be a problem. Them being rich didn't seem to, uh, you know, have a lot to do with it. He went after their money. Yeah. Well, the need for exposition is always there in a film, but the Duke just knows way too much. He takes the mystery out of everything. He's more of a tour guide than a real (laughs) character, explaining everything as we go along. It's like having Gandalf on your devil-busting team. He knows everything. Also, I'm starting to believe that all older British people are masters of of hypnosis. Seems like they can all do it. In these movies, they can. Yeah, they can. Well, this was Christopher Lee's personal favorite of the Hammerfells, and he's fine in this. He's fine. 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 But being a a hero just really isn't his thing. Liked him better as Dracula. Yeah, and he didn't even speak in Dracula much. (laughs) Well, his character just isn't that interesting. He's too knowledgeable and too infallible. You know he's going to win, and he kind of makes it boring doing it because he knows too much. Charles Gray is his usual creepy self. I've never seen him be bad in anything. (laughs) All the antique cars in this are really cool, and there's a lot of them, and there's Mm -hmm. even like antique car chases. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of good imagery and costumes here, 
and you just know a lot of sat satanic things probably got based on what the visuals in this movie the goat and some of the, the, the pentagrams and all that either this was a very well researched movie or it invented a lot of these things and I lean toward the, some that of, part some of each yeah. yeah there's a lot of good imagery and costumes here although the ending was just a little too abrupt and a little too convenient and a lot of it didn't make any logical sense still it had a lot of good parts I don't know why this isn't more well-known among the horror classics. And it was released in the U.S. as The Devil's Bride. Cause, yeah. Because they did think it would sound like a Western. Yeah. So they changed the U.S. title. Yeah, this all takes place in the British countryside in the early 1900s because they had cars and telephones. But, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not a Western. No, not it not sort, a, sort not of sounds really, like not one. Not really, yeah. Not really. Speaking of things that are not a Western, did you see any short films this week? I did. I saw it about oh, 20 minutes ago. What was it called? <laughs> the, no, not The Prey, just Prey. P-R-E-Y. No, the other kind of Prey. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Prey, P-R-E-Y. Prey, 2020. The link in the show notes so you can watch it on YouTube. I thought this was delightful. Yeah. In every way. Written and directed by Bill Wearity. Stars Jacob Zakar, Jessica Cook, James Sixa, Monty Lamonti. I like that. Hmm. And Kim House, <laughs> four minutes and 57 seconds. Monte Lamonte. Monte Lamonte. Yes. Hmm. It doesn't even sound like it's kind of a Spanish name. Mm -hmm. Yes, senor. I am Monte Lamonte. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. It's memorable, at least. Cool name. And did you like it? I did, yeah. Is there a but? No, there is no but. I All right. It. I thought it was terrific. I thought it was really good, too. Yeah. yeah. So a young couple leaves the movie theater... And they weren't paying too much attention to the film. Uh -huh. mm. They head straight <laughs> into the parking garage, and they notice that they're being followed by a strange truck. Soon they're being chased by the truck, and they have to hide. Finally, they safely get into their car. On the other hand, that may not be as safe as they thought. Hmm. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Well, if you're being chased by a guy in a truck in a parking garage, you just go stand between the other cars. There's hundreds of safe places to stand or even hide if necessary. Why they had to run out in the open and get chased down by the truck is well, they didn't, plot reasons. They didn't really, they were kind of running between the cars and run into their car. And, you know. They were entirely too upset. Hmm. The guy made no effort to get out of his truck that we saw in the hmm. beginning anyway. Okay, that said, the film is really well made. The acting sets and lighting is really good. And I mentioned the good lighting because everything takes place here in a dark parking garage. And you can actually you can see, see everything. everything. Yeah. It's really well done for yeah, it, it a is. dark thing. Mm -hmm. It's a dark film where you can see. Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> the story is fairly predictable, but then again, it's four minutes long and it's very well done. And I was entertained. Mm -hmm. It's only four minutes. But it's a good, strong four minutes. Yeah. Yeah, totally yeah. good. This one's a winner for sure. Which takes us to our Italian film of the week, Tenabra from 1982. And I will admit I have seen this one before in Italian with subtitles, so this was not new for me. We saw it. But I'd forgotten the ending. I'd forgotten who did it. So dubbed it was like new. Dubbed version this time around. Yeah, this one's dubbed. Uh, directed by Dario Agento. Written by him also. Stars Anthony Franciosa, Giuliano Gemma, and Christian Borromeo. Hour and 41 minutes. And you can get it either subtitled or dubbed. I thought the dubbing was reasonably... You could you could tell it was dubbed, but it mm -hmm. wasn't bad. Sometimes their lips didn't match. But, you know, yeah. It's because it they were speaking Italian and we so. were hearing English. So I'd seen this before, and I noticed it was now on Shutter. It had just been released like last week on Shutter. So I'm like, we should watch Tanabra. Mm -hmm. And Kevin's like, what? He didn't know this one. I'd never seen this. So what'd you think? It was okay. I didn't love it. Okay. It was okay. okay. It, would, it was just okay. Movie of the week kind of thing? Uh, it kind of felt like, you know, an old made-for-TV movie. Kind of. Yeah, it kind of did. It's not. kind of had that feel to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought it was too long and not interesting enough. Okay. Yeah. No, I won't argue with you. It is kind of long. I remember it being better than that, but it's good. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I hate, give it. I a, didn't hate I it. give it a seven. Yeah. Six. Six and a half. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Peter Neal, the author of the mystery book Tanabra, 
which I don't even know what that means in Italian. I think I knew that once. Rides his bicycle. Yeah, look, somebody's going to look that up for somebody's me. Somebody's going to okay. look that up. Somebody has a pantry. <clears throat> so he rides his bicycle to the San Francisco airport, followed by his baggage in a car. He parks the bicycle, hands it off, and his chauffeur gives him his clothes. What the point of this scene was, I do not know, other than to make him look like some sort of California weirdo who rides his bike everywhere. Although that there's nothing about his personality where that ever comes up again. Go so figure. he goes yeah. to the San Francisco airport, and he's about to fly to Rome. He gets a phone call, and someone steals his bag while he's not paying attention. He then finds the bag around the corner, but we know that someone has tampered with it. Meanwhile, a girl in Rome shoplifts the Tenabra book from a department store. Do we know what Tenabra means? In Latin, it literally means darkness. Oh. In the Roman Catholic Church, it is, uh, was for the last three days of Holy Week, at which candles are successively extinguished. Well, things do get su- successively extinguished here. Yes, a Holy Week service, Wednesday through Friday. I don't think that's got anything to do with it. I think it's probably the Latin darkness. darkness, yes. So we're watching this film, The Latin Darkness. Yeah. Starring La Monte Monte. No, No, not in this one. (laughs) The Latin, okay. So anyway, so this girl shoplifts that book from a department store and she gets caught. She offers the security guy her home address to let her go, and he agrees. So she leaves and she's attacked by a homeless guy on the street, which seems to be treated like a typical day in Rome. She gets home, and then someone kills her, then stuffs her mouth full of pages torn from the book. Hmm. The killer then takes her photo once she's dead. Peter then arrives in Rome, and is immediately called a sexist on TV for writing his trashy novel. We meet his agent, named Bulmer, who tells Peter that he's a major success in Italy, and he's got all kinds of public publicity events lined up. Now, first shot... This is, uh, Bulmer is John Saxon, sort mm-hmm. of a long, you know, he's been in a million things. Yeah. And I'm like, yep, yeah, he's the killer, doing it for publicity. <laughs> well, Peter opens his bag and finds his stuff was trashed and covered in blood. It's always the second biggest character in the movie in these things, isn't it? it the the seems, second biggest actor. It seems like it, yeah. Who doesn't seem all that important, but they're there for a reason. Hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's not. Well, Peter opens Spoiler. his bag and finds his stuff. Oh, yeah, we're going to spoil it. Yeah. Sort of. No, not entirely. We're not going to tell the final ending. Peter opens his bag and finds his stuff was trashed and covered in blood, which happened back at the San Francisco airport. A homicide detective then questions him about the dead shoplifter, but Peter was clearly on the plane at the time and doesn't know anything about it. The detective thinks that since Peter wrote the book, there might be a connection. So if you ever kill somebody with a Stephen King book, hmm. watch out, Stephen. The book involves a killer who uses an open-edged razor, and that's how the girl was killed as well. We then cut away to a topless girl giving a show on the beach to four men at once. Then the girl and three guys attack the fourth man. And this seems like it's very clearly a flashback by what we have to assume is the killer. The two girls... Ah, we go back to the present. Two girls, one of whom is topless in every scene, because it's Italian. And there's boobies. There's lots, yes. Yeah, Dario Argento. What? Boobies? Yep. (laughs) One of his trademarks. They live together in an apartment building and are arguing about some guy they both like. And there's some lesbian comments made later on, but they're both involved with the same man, so I'm not sure how that fits. Because they're roommates and one of them shows their boobies and therefore they must be lesbians. I don't know. Yeah, it seems like a stretch. It was the 80s. There was no indication that they were lovers or anything or any romance between them. No. Yeah, so I don't know where that came from. Yeah. And one soon soon becomes the next victim of the killer, and the second girl follows minutes later. Peter starts regretting ever having written the Tanabra book, and then he sees Jane, his ex-wife, who's supposed to be back home in the USA. Hmm. Hmm. Could Hmm. she be stalking him? Could she be involved? A girl is being chased by an insane dog, and she finds an open door and goes inside. It's the killer's hideout. What a terrible choice of places to hide. (laughs) Convenient. Well, she finds his photos, papers, and even the little cutout letters he uses to make secret notes. He stuffs her pockets full of... She stuffs her pockets full of evidence, and the killer comes in and cleans things up, (laughs) starting with her. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter's secretary spots Jane on the road again. 
She definitely is in town. Peter and his assistant then track down their suspect, a creepy reporter, who they see murdered with an axe to the forehead. Thunk. Well, we cut back to that girl we saw on the beach earlier, and this time we see her killed with a knife. Peter then tells Bulmer, the agent, that he wants to leave Rome. Bulmer suggests renting a house in the hills instead until this all blows over. We then see that Bulmer is having an affair with Jane. Oh my. That's why she's in town. Uh-huh. Soon, Bulmer is stabbed in a crowded mall there. And that was just really abrupt and out of the blue and you don't... Like, how did they do that? You oh. walk up and stab somebody in a crowded mall and nobody notices. And nobody notices, yeah. Yeah, maybe. if he'd have yelled, then they might have... Yeah. Maybe he did yell. I don't remember now. No, not really. It's, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, Peter's assistant remembers that he saw the reporter admit to the murders just before he was killed. So, who killed Bulmer? Hmm. So, there's more than one people Could be. doing killing. Could be. Huh. He doesn't get a chance to tell anybody about this revelation because he's the next to die. Jane calls Peter's secretary, Anne, but before Anne arrives, Jane gets put to the axe in the goriest scene of the film. Which wasn't her either. Which Quentin Tarantino is reported to say that he was especially fond of that death scene. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good one. Where she paints the wall, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gusher. Yeah. Scenes later, you still see the paint. Yeah. The, 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 the blood. The, yeah. <laughs> so the female homicide detective arrives, and she's next on the list. Finally, we find out who the murderer is. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'd seen this movie before, like, 10, 15 years ago. I didn't remember who the murderer was till the very end. So it was like but a whole new movie I, for me. I did like that ending, and then the ending. Yeah. It's kind of kind of got a double ending, and yeah. I, yeah, I, it's, I it's uh, yeah. yeah, let's not give too much away there. No, no. Well, the mm. 80s soundtrack really stands out in this one. It's pretty badly dubbed on Shudder, but I originally saw it in Italian with subtitles, so it is available both ways. There's a lot of long, sweeping, moody shots of the interior and exterior of some interesting buildings, which is interesting to watch. Very interesting. There's course. like a five-minute scene of the camera floating around outside the brick house that the two, two girls lived <laughs> in. And it goes up over the roof and down the wall and across this window and up to that window and... It, it's kind of pointless, but, but it's definitely trivia, atmospheric. Trivia says it took three days to put that shot together. It that, did, that okay. Sequence. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, according to the trivia, this is some some, some mild flavor of post-apocalyptic film. So Argento but, said this. And knowing that ahead of time, I still didn't really see that. I didn't realize it the first time I saw it, and it's really kind of irrelevant to the second one also. Yeah. Which explains why everything in Rome is so deserted and isolated. The shoplifter walks home down the street, gets attacked by a homeless man in the bright daylight in a residential street, and nobody says a thing. Yeah, I guess. Most of the scenes in the malls, the girl runs down the street at night, chased by the dog, and she screams, and the dog yells, and nobody, nobody does yeah, anything. Nobody, yeah. So it is very isolated. But then when Bulmer is in the in the mall waiting for somebody, he gets stabbed. There's people everywhere. Crowded, yeah. Looks normal. Yeah. It's deserted when it's convenient to be. Plot device. Other than a general lack of people, there's nothing specific or even obvious about this idea of whatever the apocalypse was. And in my first viewing, I missed it completely. So, yeah. Now I wouldn't put too much stock in that. Like somebody was complaining that there weren't enough people in it, and he made up a story. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right, which yeah. takes us to our newish movie this week, The Platform from 2019. El Hoyo. El what? El Hoyo. El Hoyo. El Hoyo. Is H -O -Y -O. it starring Monty Del Monte or whatever? No? No. Okay. No. <laughs> Directed by Galder Gaztelu. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you're going to murder these names. <laughs> Directed by Galder Gaztelu Yerusha. Written by David DeSola. Stars Ivan Masagui, Zorian Equilior, and Antonia San Juan. And we apologize for minutes. those pronunciations. Yeah, because those people probably aren't dead. They care. Yeah, yeah. All right, so this is The Platform. It's available on Netflix, and I was going to put an Amazon link, for, you know, our usual affiliate, and it's not available to buy. So yep. for now, at yep. least, get it on Netflix and nowhere else. Did you like it? I loved it. 
Why? Because it was good. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird, and the characters were engrossing, and the, you, you wanted to see what was happening next, and you never knew quite what was going on. In in a way, uh, it kept reminding me of uh, it kind of rhymes I know what with gonna say. Cube. It's, uh-huh. What's it say right there in my notes? Oh, it does. <laughs> See, we hadn't discussed this. Previously. If there was one film no. that I would compare this to, it Cube. would be Cube. Yeah, yeah. Where it's people trapped in a place, then they don't understand exactly what's going on, and we don't exactly understand what's yeah. going on or where this place is, why these people are being kept there. There's a lot of unanswered things, um, but very cool, very, but it's very, very fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, we start out with scenes from a very fancy kitchen and numerous chefs creating the perfect meal. This is high-end fancy stuff. Oh, super, super, yeah. And there's one head chef who's really militant about it. Later on, we see him going through, he found a hair in something, and he's... Oh, he's going through comparing (laughs) whose hair is it. (laughs) Yeah, and all this hair, all this food is going straight down to the prisoners who really don't care. It's never explained why they get such fancy food. part, yeah, Uh uh-huh. Yeah. Well, it, Feed later, them well. Well, later it began. Uh, it's it's mentioned the the main character guy, uh, Goring. They ask him what his favorite dish is. Yep. And uh-huh. she says, oh, "Well, that'll be included." So maybe there's, you know, every all these all these foods on there are yeah. people's favorite dish. You know, and as part some of some kind of escargot. Part of the torment. Yeah, that was his. That was his favorite. But. All right, so we got the numerous chefs creating the perfect meal. Then we fade out, and then back in to two men in a large stone room. The old man tells the newcomer that he's in the hole on level 48. Well, and that's where it was like the cube, too. He wakes up. Yeah. And he doesn't yeah. have How'd I you know, get here? How'd I get here? Yeah. Where is this place? Yeah. Well, he explains that the people on level 48, the two of them, get to eat the people on level 47's leftovers. And it's, and it's, it's, Better than a lot of the left. The oh, yeah, you're seat. lucky to be here. Yeah, you're lucky to be on level 48. And yeah. there's this huge floor, huge hole in the floor and the ceiling that seems to fall through an infinite number of levels beneath them. Yeah, it's a rectangular hole. You can look up and down, and it's there's cells at each level. You yeah. can kind of see the people above and below somewhat. Yeah. yeah. Well, the newcomer's name is Gorang, and the old man is Trimagasi. Well, Trimagasi explains that level 48 is a good level. The people above won't talk to you, and he's not to talk to the people below because they're below us. They'll be on level 48 for exactly one month, and then eh, we'll see. Hmm, what Hmm. happens then? Yeah. A light on the wall changes, and a huge platform of food descends through the hole. Perfectly sized through the rectangle. Trimagasi begins stuffing his face. And they're eating the leftovers from 94 other people. The people above, yeah. you know, who have gotten it so far. Yeah. But Trimagasi says, that's okay because there won't be that many people left by the end of the month. <laughs> and after two or three minutes, the food descends to the next level. So you get to eat once a day, you better make it count. Mm-hmm. We get a flashback that seems to indicate that Goreng actually volunteered to be there. Which is, you know, and it's not clear, you know, you volunteer and he gets it a a, a diploma. Of an accredited kind. diploma. An accredited diploma. So apparently you can volunteer for this, but he didn't know fully what he was going into. and uh, his cellmate, Which makes it seem like it's more of some kind of a psychological experiment than a real prison punishment deal. Seem. Yeah, yeah. And the, the Trimagasi, I don't know if you're going to mention that, how he killed somebody, uh-huh. which was more or less an accidental. He had a tantrum and threw a television out the window and it landed on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and killed him. But he's going to do, so what they, they say, two years? One year. One year, okay. Yeah, 12 months. Yeah. 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 They gave him the choice, come in, come in the, the, the hole or a psychiatric hospital. And he chose the hole. So that's yeah. why he's there. Yeah. Okay, so Goreng chose to do six months in the hole to get an accredited diploma. We assume that's, you know, an educational diploma for a job. Trim- Timagasi killed a man by dropping a TV on his head. <laughs> And then they reassign the levels every month, but the two people stay t- stay paired off. 
Yeah, well, Timagasi's Tim been there like eight, nine months already. Yeah. And, you know, so Gorang's like, what you, you know, what happened to your previous roommate then? <laughs> well, that's kind of a funny story. Yeah. yeah. We find out. Yeah. Well, Trimagasi <laughs> explains that he used to be on level <clears throat> 132 at one point. None of the food ever makes it down that far. And he says, that doesn't mean I didn't have anything to eat, ominously. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's only really dangerous, he says, if you're assigned at two lower levels two months in a row. You can mostly do without food for a month, he says. And it seems like the assignments must be random. Seems that way. Eventually, someone from above suicides down the shaft. (laughs) Someone down below gets some free meat. Mm -hmm. It's all very depressing and weird, but Goreng starts to get used to the routine... Then the end of the month comes, and the two wake up on level 171. That's pretty bad. Where Goring learns that Trimagasi is not such a nice guy after all. The platform comes down, and it's covered in empty dishes, not even bones. So the point of the story is eat or be eaten, and that's the only rule in this prison. I mean, Vertical, vertical self-management, self-management Center. center. <laughs> That's what the administrators call it. It's not a prison. It's a vertical <laughs> self-management center. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, there's so much more to it. After. That's oh, yeah, that's of, about maybe the halfway that's point. kind of what I was expecting, because that's kind of all that all the previews give away. Yeah, and then, and then at so this much point, more we know what all the rules that. are. Yeah. So much more happens after. Yeah. Oh, and it's neat, too, when the, at some point in the night, the platform goes back up. And it, it is just a blur. And <laughs> Nobody's jumping onto that thing. <laughs> um, and it's apparently, you know, they, and that, they never explain that either. There's no cables. There's no nothing. It just levitates down and floats down. Yeah. On a, there's a lot of things that are not explained. Back. A lot of things not explained. Yeah. yeah, you can't climb up the cables. There's no pillar to slide down. It's mm-hmm. it's a magic platform. Mm-hmm. Well, the setting here is everything which reminded me immediately of the film Cube, <laughs> which I also enjoyed tremendously. It's one of obviously, my favorites. Obviously. Oh, and they use the word obviously <laughs> like 70 times. No, 26 times. Okay. It's, it's here in the trivia. Obvio. 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 It's subtitled. <laughs> Didn't even mention that. It's subtitled. Mm-hmm. It, the world of Cube was also a world of rules, sudden death, and betrayals, and there's absolutely no logic behind why a government would have a place like this but if you just accept that and move on, it's a really interesting little world with interesting rules. And like Cube, you don't know how big it is. Yeah. At first. It took a long time to explain all the rules and really understand the situation, and that was kind of the majority of the fun with the film. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea where it was going or heading until the end, and the story just sort of developed on its own, which was great. You kind of expect maybe there's a prison break, or maybe there's a prison revolt, or maybe he finds an interesting way to survive and you don't know where this is going where is it going to go we're not going to tell it's a you. lot of rules yeah <laughs> there's definitely some religious and political commentary here if you oh, want to take the time, time to think about yeah. it anti-capitalism and yeah yeah, and yeah. <laughs> the ones on top you know having it good and the ones at the bottom killing each other <laughs> trickle down dinner yeah 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 yeah, there's, there, I'm sure that there are going to be people who write papers on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good to see that. And I'd like mm-hmm. to get into all the political and religious commentary on all that, but you know, right now I'm just hungry. I don't like the way you're looking at me. <laughs> Yum. Yeah. Mm. So and, anyway, I th- that was my favorite of the of the four. For sure. Yeah, the I platform. think so. Yeah. And I didn't really want... I I was. I put it off for like three days. You, you did. Want, you yeah. want to watch the platform? No, I yeah. didn't want to. I was watching Doctor Who instead. So many, <laughs> so many horror films on Netflix are just a waste of time. This one was not a waste of no, time. No, it's really good. It was really yeah. excellent. Yeah. The <laughs> Platform, 2019. Check yeah. it out. It is subtitled, mm-hmm. but it's not. there's not that much worth dialogue. It. It's worth, worth it. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well... That's our show. That's our show. Thanks for joining us. Stop in during the week at HorrorGuys.com for all the usual stuff. Read the reviews. uh, Search for old stuff. We've got every single movie we have ever talked about on the show. All 74 episodes. The reviews are on there. It's a lot of movies. Uh, Not quite 400 yet. A lot of reviews. It's a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Including all the shorts. You click on the uh, tag for shorts and you've got all kinds of fun stuff you can watch. Yeah. But get ready for next week when we'll be watching some more classics. Mm-hmm. We'll begin with 
Frankenstein must be destroyed from 68. I don't think I saw that. I don't think I did. All the names kind of sound alike to me, so I I couldn't tell you at this point. There's a problem I might have. Yeah. Or I might have been taken to see it when I was three and, you know, don't remember. He has (laughs) seen more gross horror movies when he was two and three. Oh, yeah. My folks had. I saw before I was 20. My folks had no problem taking me to all kinds of things. Yeah. (laughs) Drive in, movie theater. Yeah. 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 As a wee lad on up. Yeah. It didn't affect your development at all, did it? <laughs> well, it's a little frustrating sometimes because there's some movies I can just barely remember bits of. And it's like, wow, was that as scary as I remember? And some are not. <laughs> some I found, it's like, oh, that's awful. <laughs> oh, that's oh yeah, bad. most of them would impress a three-year-old, sure. Yeah, it was scary then. <laughs> <laughs> Frankenstein must be destroyed from 68. The Boogeyman will get you from 1942. Amityville 3D from 1983. And we're finally, maybe, possibly going to get to Dr. Sleep from 2019. Maybe. And we'll have a short or two. <laughs> unless something more interesting sounding comes along. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm Brian. I'm Kevin. We'll see you next week.